I request that we each assure that our phones are in silent mode to limit interruptions of our meeting. You may notice committee members utilizing electronic devices during the meeting. This is for access to committee meeting materials that are in electronic format. May I have a roll call for our licensing committee meeting? Dr. Krause. Present. Dr. Gonadev. Here. Dr. Hawkins. Here. Ms. Pines. Here. Mr. Warmoth. Here. Dr. Hawkins. Here again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I request that we each be respectful of the need to conduct the committee's business. Should anyone I may ask that person to conduct him or herself in a professional manner that permits the committee to continue its business. This meeting will be available by teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will facilitate the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star one. You will hear a tone indicating that you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press the pound sign. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, during agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the committee has limited the public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes in total. In addition, the public comment period for individuals here at the meeting will also be limited to 20 minutes in total. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Board staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The committee welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the committee's intent to ask for public comment prior to the committee taking action on any agenda item. If I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on the item, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. I would like to remind all speakers to complete a presenter slip so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and so that the record of this meeting may be complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker slips to Ms. Cruz. Ms. Cruz, thank you. I will call upon each person who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make a last minute comment but request that you fill out a speaker slip after your comments so we have it for the record. I want to remind all speakers to stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. We plan to end today at 2 p.m. This meeting is called to order. Uh, thank you. Uh, we do have a quorum. Members are reminded that we will be taking a roll call vote on each uh, action item. Uh, moving to agenda item number two, public comments on items not on the agenda. I have no speaker slips. Are there any comments on the phone? Are there any comments on the phone? No comments at this time. Moving to agenda item number three, approval of minutes from April 27th, 2017 licensing committee meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the April 2017 minutes from the member members? May I have a motion to approve these as submitted? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any public comments on the minutes of the April 27, 2017 meeting? Any comments on the phone? Are there any comments on the phone? No comments at this time. Ms. Cruz, please call roll.
Ms. Pines? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Krause? Aye. Uh, I'd like to take the liberty of returning to uh, item two, public comments on items not on the agenda. Uh, I've been handed a uh, speaker slip. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hannah Ree, uh, you may come to the microphone. Yes, hello. Uh, I thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I feel so honored and blessed to be, have this opportunity to sit in front of you and to um, discuss our, and for me to um, discuss our grassroots uh, movement. Um, and I apologize, I'm not a public speaker. Uh, so um, uh, basically as, as we in healthcare and medicine no, there is a, um, there's still a, a large, significant, chronic um, health care disparity between um, whites and non-whites within the African American community, especially in um, fields such as uh, rheumatology. Um, and so uh, we started a movement called Black Patients Matter. And our hope is that it will create a win-win situation for everyone, um, for the, the patients, um, of course, specifically, but also for um, the scientific research as I go through my inbox from the ACR, American College of Rheumatology, uh, there are always um, uh, notes in there about um, having uh, patients, black patients, sign up for studies to better understand chronic illnesses such as um, lupus, sarcoidosis, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, and sometimes they're all in, in one patient. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible and sad. Um, so um, the group not Black Patients Matter as a grassroots, it's very um, informal. Um, much of it is uh, through uh, social media. But it's, it's amazing and uh, wonderful, but somewhat um, sad to see that um, it, it does touch a large uh, percentage of um, folks in, in certain areas, such as Los Angeles, such as East Bay, such as Sacramento. Um, so certainly we have all of these um, government funded grants looking at uh, minority health. But I, uh, we feel and, and we really want the opportunity uh, to work with the medical board as far as um, increasing the number of um, providers who Please can. Please conclude. Yes, thank you. Um, the number of minority providers. So certainly um, the medical board, as I sit in, in front of you, is, is diverse, very diverse, uh, but not diverse enough. I think we can do better. I think that um, as a member of the CMA, as a member of the uh, EMOS, Ethnic uh, Medical Association Subcommittee, I know we can do better, much better, and, and not just at the level of um, the, the physicians, the um, primary Dr. care doctors. Dr. Reed, your oh, time yeah. is up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Ree. Uh, there's a speaker slip uh, from uh, Christina Hildebrand. You may come to the microphone. Thank you for taking me. I 
traffic was a little bit worse than I thought it was going to be. Um, I wanted to address this committee specifically uh, with regards to licensing um, and, and what you're looking at. Um, my concern is specifically with the uh, medical physicians, both um, MDs and DOs that are being brought before the medical board um, with regards to writing medical exemptions under SB 277. Uh, the medical exemptions under SB 277 were um, outlined in the legislature as allowing family history and basically allowing it, Governor Brown in his signing statement said that it was up to the discretion of the doctors. And what we've been hearing from doctors, I should have started off by saying, so I, I represent a Voice for Choice Advocacy, um, which is an advocacy group um, that is for both consumers and physicians, basically anyone. Um, and we, we have been talking to both consumers, to patients and to doctors, and have found that many doctors are afraid of losing their license because they're writing legitimate medical exemptions, but the medical board has been writing um, letters to them basically saying, we're watching you. Um, there are public health officials, for example, one um, on May 10th of 2018 at a hearing on a budget item in the legislature said, the one piece that we haven't closed is the ability to investigate. Unfortunately, some fraudulent physicians who for financial gain and philosophy are writing medical exemptions inappropriately, and we do not have the authority to investigate those issues. Um, we fear that Senator Pan or another senator or legislature is going to bring bills forward to tighten up those medical exemptions, and that's the one place that we have left as consumers to be able to make a choice and to, to be able to go find physicians that will listen to our children who have had medical issues with vaccinations. Um, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but HHS just settled a lawsuit with Robert F. Kennedy stating that they did not have, they haven't done what they should have done for the past 30 years. The 1986 Vaccine, uh, vaccine Injury Act stated that they had to report every two years on the safety of vaccines and do an overview of all new vaccines. They have not done that for the last 30 years. And so there is really no oversight on these vaccine manufacturers that have no liability at all of their product. There is no way you can sue a manufacturer for, for having a seizure, for having some adverse effect. And so the doctors are the last line or the first line when it comes to vaccine injury because there's nothing you can do other than go to your doctor. Um, and when these doctors are giving medical exemptions for completely legitimate reasons, they shouldn't be being witch hunted. They should be allowed to practice as they practice. There are more and more doctors that, I would say 99% of doctors in this state refuse to give a medical exemption based on family history. So if a child has died or has a sibling who has seizures, they won't give them because they're scared of you coming after them. Um, and I understand it's that you know, it's legitimate when it comes down to, you know, somebody else coming forward and saying, I have a problem with this doctor. But when it comes down to licensing in the medical board and the California Public Health Department, really witch hunting them, it's a really serious problem because our doctors are the last place we have to, to be concerned with vaccine injury. And they have to be able to support their patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hildebrandt. Moving to agenda item number four, licensing program update. Ms. Alameda. Good afternoon. First, before I give my update, I do want to uh, thank all of the licensing staff for their hard work and dedication. Um, we are busy all year round, uh, but June and July seems to be the busiest, and without their dedication, we would not be able to get through it. The licensing program continues to review initial applications within 28 days and processes incoming mail within seven, without the need of overtime. A staff service analyst has been hired in the Consumer Information Unit to act as a lead and assist with the high volume of calls, the most difficult calls, identify trends, develop training plans, and assist with the board's strategic plan to reduce the call wait times and provide better customer service. Um, effective July 1st, um, the expiration of a license is no longer based on birth month. Licenses will now be issued for two years and will expire on the last day of the month in which it was issued. The board's website has been updated to reflect this change as well as all of our forms. 
The licensing program has also completed a new employee onboarding plan to ensure that all new staff receive timely and appropriate training and that new staff are successful in their new positions. The licensing program is participating in a pilot project with the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities to check their website for possible discipline information on individuals that are applying from um, countries, from other countries, sorry. Management and staff have prepared an impl implementation plan to prepare for the new licensing requirements that will take place January 1st, 2020. That will be discussed uh, further in agenda item number five. That completes my update. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments from our board members? Dr. Yanadev? Uh, no questions, April. I just on behalf of the entire board, I want to compliment the licensing division. You do an amazing job, uh, especially when it comes to the medical students who just finished and starting their residencies, when they are international graduates, they have to go through the PTAL program. And you've been uh, bending over backwards to accommodate them so that they don't lose their residency program, which is extremely important. Thanks. Thank you. On this item, uh, Ms. Alameda's licensing program update, are there any comments from those in the room? Oh, sorry, Dr. Hawkins. Thanks again. So why did was the uh, renewal time change from the date of birth to when it gets renewed? And will it make a difference? Why was it changed, actually? I believe it was changed to give uh, for a full two years. This gives the full 24 months, rather as before it was, could be 15 months, 16 months. So this was as a result of legislation um, that had actually been um, recommended a few years ago trying to get all of the boards to prorate the licenses because if it's on the birth month, you might not get it. You could get anywhere from 13 months. Um, pay, you're paying a full amount, but you're getting it for either 13 months or 24 months. And so we decided that rather than doing the prorating, which would actually hold up the license process, we would just issue licenses from two basically two years from the issuance date because we didn't want the reason people wanted to do the birth month was because you could have ebbs and flows if you didn't do it that way so you'd have one month that would be really high for renewals but for us if you look at when we license people it's pretty steady across the entire year so we don't have that so we decided the issuance date putting it two years forward would be better so even though we didn't get put in that prorating bill we said well we we will change ours and we actually were able to get that into our sunset bill so that's where it came from Thank you. are there any comments on this item on the phone any comments on the phone no comments at this time Moving to agenda item number five, update on the changes to postgraduate training requirements. Ms. Alameda. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a, a PowerPoint up here uh, just to go over briefly what the changes are. So effective uh, January 1st, 2020, the postgraduate training uh, requirements are changing to 36 months for a board approved program for all applicants, regardless of the medical school that they had uh, attended. Um, the individuals will have to complete 24 consecutive months in their program before a license can be issued. Um, a postgraduate training license will be required for all California residents. Um, this uh, training license will not be required to be renewed uh, once, once it is issued. As long as there's no changes in their program, uh, it will uh, remain that way until they complete their program. Um, for our international graduates, they will no longer require a postgraduate training license. Uh, in a California program, they will also obtain a training license. Um, the board will no longer uh, recognize international medical schools. Uh, the board will uh, recognize international medical schools as meeting the educational requirements for a training license or a license if the school that they attended is in the World Federation for Medical Education and the Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research World Directory of the Medical School Joint Directly or the World Directory of Medical Schools. Um, 
A training li license is required to be obtained by the board within 180 days from the beginning of a program. Uh, following the 36 months of successful completion, uh, the holder of a training license will be required to obtain a full and unrestricted license. They do have 90 days for that. Um, we do recommend that any resident, uh, as soon as they receive confirmation that they are entering into a California program to apply for a training license, they do not have to wait until they actually start. Uh, the training license, the trainee will be issued a pocket license. That training license will display the name and the program of the individual, and it will be displayed on our website. This is one of the biggest questions I get right now is uh, with a holder of a training license, will they be required or will they be allowed to moonlight? And the law does allow that as long as it is approved in writing by the program director. Um, after 36 months of uh, successful training, the trainee will apply to transition their training license to a physician and surgeon certificate within 90 days. Some information for program directors to be aware of, uh, they are going to be required to complete a enrollment form for each resident that's participating in their program. This is what we need to show proof that they're in a California program. Um, if there are any changes in a residency's program, for example, leave of absence, um, any delays, the program director will be required to notify the board of those changes. We will need to keep track of the time spent in their training and to ensure that they are getting the 36 months that they need. Um, what I have here is our implementation timeline from the beginning of the bill throughout the end of December 2020 and with a couple different this is also a list of all the tasks that we have identified that need to be completed um, milestones and um, this is also just a different uh, you know grid of all of the the tasks and that completes my presentation does anyone have any questions thank you Ms. Alameda Dr. Gnanadev. Uh, thank you, Ms. Alameda. I, this is why our sunset bill. There are still questions coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, everybody who sees is blaming me for doing this one, but that's a different thing we did the, for the consumer protection. Uh, so a couple things, which one of the two things I could not answer when people asked me was, what if someone have a license in another state after one year of training? There are states where you get license after one year of training and they apply to California. What happens to them? They would be required to have three years before they can have a license. Even though they have the license in another state? That's correct. Yeah, I, that's why I just, well, I wasn't sure. I'm sure we'll get some beef on that one. Um, Second one is certain things like CMS requires a licensed physician to write a restraint order. Usually second year and third year residents write the uh, restraint orders in a hospital. So we need to look into and see, and, uh, see how as we write the regulations, when can they do it with the training license? So or it has to be only by the attending physicians, which, be, which makes it very difficult uh, in large teaching hospitals when something emergently required to be done, so. I actually have a question for Carrie on that one. Um, is this falling under the program director to make that decision? with their training license, that they would be allowed to do that if it's if written authorization? Well, the, the law says that they can practice medicine with this training license. So we'll have to um, look in to be able to get okay. clarification on that, but uh, they are permitted to practice okay. medicine as a resident and 
all of its forms. I actually wanted to go back to Dr. Ganadev's question about somebody licensed in another state. So under 2135.5, um, this is a, a section that will become operative on January 1st. So under that, um, the individual that comes in, um, and Ms. Webb can correct me if I'm wrong, but from reading this, if the individual holds an unrestricted license as a physician and surgeon in another state and has held that continuously for four years, um, if the individual is a board certified, and then if they're not subject to denial, so they don't have anything in their background, and then also if they're not subject to disciplinary action, haven't been subject to disciplinary action in another state, then they can actually be licensed here in California. So they'll meet the requirements if they fall under that category. So someone who finished one year of training and not board certified, has a full unrestricted license in another state, cannot get a license here? Not at this time. I'm not sure what changes are going through so it, this year, but it, yeah. It's okay with us because okay. the reason we did this, remember that is somebody gets uh, not, somebody doesn't get a second year spot in a residency because of poor performance. And that person, if they went to U.S. medical school or somebody went to international medical school, that's two years, they are eligible to get full license. So that was the reason why we changed. So we want to make sure, I think if it is four years of practice and board certification, that automatically qualifies them, so you're okay. So. I have a quick question. Um, what about a doctor that um, was practicing in the state, license was revoked, and the license, they were looking for their license to be reinstated, and they didn't have the so, three years. So if they come back it, that under those circumstances, if for revocation or surrender, they actually go through our petition for reinstatement of license, which is a different process. Okay. So they would be able to come back in and be licensed. Okay, perfect. Yeah, but what I suggest to Kerry and... Uh, and uh, April is uh, look into this thing because these are federal laws, CMS requirements. Uh, this is Center for Medicaid, Medicaid Services, which has certain requirements with certain conditions. Like one, I give, one example I gave is uh, seclusion and restraints. Uh, so we need to carefully look into and see, make sure that how we, uh, how can this be done uh, without uh, skirting with the federal law. Thank you, members. Are there any comments or questions from the audience? Any comments on the phone? Any comments on the phone? No comments at this time. Moving to agenda item number six, update on continuing medical education audits. Ms. Alameda. Okay. Uh, each renewal cycle, physician and surgeons, special faculty permit holders, and midwives must complete a specific amount of continuing education and must maintain documentation of the courses completed for a minimum of four years. If the board audits a licensee or permit holder, they must submit a copy of their records to show compliance with the CE requirements. By the end of this year, the licensing program is increasing the percentage of audits performed to 10%, which is an increase of approximately 1,100 audits per month. In addition, the board is issuing an administrative citation and fine to a licensee or permit holder that certifies on their renewal notice that he or she completed the required continuing education requirements but was found non-compliant. That's my update. Do you have any questions? Any questions or comments from board members? From the audience? Any questions or comments on the phone? Any comments on the phone? Dr. Reed, did you wish to speak to this particular issue on continuing medical education audit? Yes. I thank you uh, so much. Um, I would just uh, want to comment and, and encourage um, the board to um, uh, maybe possibly increase either the number or the percentage of CME requirements addressing minority health, especially um, for non-whites, and um, to to really focus on um, on uh, minority health as the population of California continues to di diversify, 
and um, new information is uh, being brought up in the literature and um, exciting drugs are on the market. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ree. Moving to agenda item number seven, future agenda items. Are there any agenda items to be suggested from committee members? Any agenda items for the future suggested by the audience? Dr. E? I, I thank you so much for your patience with me. Um, it's not often that I can uh, take time off uh, as, as, as other physicians uh, have problems as well. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, for the future, I, I was um, maybe wanting to uh, mention and, and uh, discuss um, the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, so as um, the, uh, the population of uh, physicians and, 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 you know, licensed workers in the state of California continues to diversify, um, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm, I'm uh, pos uh, possibly saying that um, it might be time to um, require medical e experts to have um, specific training and understanding and experience and um, work history related to working in community clinics. Um, working with uh, treating, caring for, saving the lives of uh, minority patients. Um, for medical experts, certainly we're so blessed in the state to have medical experts who, which have graduated from the best uh, medical schools, the best universities, and um, I, you know, I'm very proud to say that several of them are here in the state. Uh, but but I, I am very concerned that um, the medical experts, which we depend so much upon, do not have any specific training in ethnic diversity as evidenced on their resume. So I, I'm uh, maybe suggesting to the board that it, it might be time to e explore that um, idea and that option and whether we could be at the forefront of uh, uh, some significant drastic changes in, in health care in the state of California because certainly, um, as we all know, that the, um, the 2019 uh, budget in the sitting in the U.S. Senate has some big, big changes coming as far as Medicare and Medicaid. And so um, it would be wonderful to be in step and in line with those changes and not have to um, uh, backpedal or or uh, you know, suffer consequences from whatever that uh, that 2019 uh, budget's going to state. Please conclude. Yes, thank you. Uh, so again, um, as a member of the CMA and as a member of the Ethnic uh, Medical uh, Organization Subcommittee, I I really uh, would would ask for and would like an opportunity to discuss the importance of racial diversity. Um, training for our medical experts so when, the, when um, they're doing their job, which they do so well, um, that uh, they will have that extra information and that training and that experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ree. Are there any suggestions for future agenda items from those on the phone? Any comments on the phone? And at this time. This concludes our licensing committee meeting. Again, uh, my heartfelt thanks to Ms. Alameda and to my fellow committee members, to Ms. Kirchmeyer and to our medical board staff who are just incredible. Thank you.